Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Taylor Combalusier, a mining analyst at Red Cloud Securities. Today's webinar features BlackRock Silver. The company is focused on advancing its 100% controlled Tonopah West project in Tonopah, Nevada. The company has completed over 95,000 meters of drilling since June 15, 2020, and over 65,000 meters has been completed year to date. With the maiden resource on the horizon, BlackRock continues to report excellent drill results that add to the over 80 significant intercepts ranging from 1 to 29 meters in thickness and 200 to 4,643 grams per ton silver equivalent that have been returned from the project so far. New results also continue to demonstrate the continuity of mineralization over the planned resource area at the DPP target, which covers six high-grade veins. Today, I have with me on the webinar Andrew Pollard, President and CEO, as well as Bill Howell, Executive Chairman at BlackRock. The format of today's webinar will be comprised of two parts. In the first part, Andrew will provide an update on BlackRock's drilling campaign and guidance for the maiden resource estimate. Uh, Bill will take over and talk about the geology. He'll also touch on the new and exciting exploration potential at the Tonopah North project, which is adjacent to the Tonopah West project. Um, there's a lot uh, that investors have to look forward to in the coming months as it executes on its drill program and development initiatives, including that maiden resource. In the second part of the webinar, we'll take your questions live. So please send in the questions using the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A session. To start, we'll handle the disclosures and then get into the presentation. So for BlackRock Silver, there may be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the BlackRock corporate presentation located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Please see our most recent research located on our website for BlackRock specific disclosures. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew to update you on BlackRock and what you have to look forward to in the near term. Awesome. Thanks very much, Taylor. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, on a day like this, it looks like the red clouds are parting. Uh, we've got some blue skies ahead of us, and I'm very excited to get in front of you. Uh, I, I will say that uh, uh, what Taylor um, uh, just said is outdated because just yesterday we actually hit our highest grade intercept ever at the project uh, where we topped over five kilograms silver equivalent. So um, as info programs go, you know, boring is, is what you want and what we hit yesterday is exciting. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that, um, you know, it's our results that drove all the buying in the market today in gold and silver stocks, but uh, I can't deny that there's a correlation either. So um, <laughs> either way, it's exciting times in the industry after what was a, ver a very tepid summer uh, for all of you. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, I think we've got a hell of a, a Q4 to look forward to. And um, the biggest catalyst we've ever had as a company is going to be coming uh, down the pipe in Q1 next year. So it's a great time to get in front of you. As Taylor mentioned, uh, 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 we're, 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 there's no going back now, I'll tell you that much. Uh, we've got a lot to look forward to over the next few months here, and I'm certainly going to be looking some forward-looking statements. Uh, not that for, not, not that uh, too far forward. Uh, everything I'm going to be talking to you right now is only looking three, four months in advance max, uh, because that's when we're going to be um, delivering our maiden resource estimate. And between now and the end of the year, uh, we've got a great setup, probably the best setup we've had since we actually started drilling this project a year ago. Uh, and, and that's simply we've got 24 drill holes pending assays at the lab. Uh, the drill holes we've been releasing all summer and even just yesterday are some of the best stuff we've been hitting so far. Uh, and all of these results are going to be thrown into the pot uh, that makes our maiden resource estimate. And I think that's uh, uh, going to be the single biggest catalyst we've had. Uh, since we hit on hole one uh, uh, drilling into our project last year, which happened to be the single best uh, drill hole in all of Nevada in 2020. Um, obviously, Red Cloud's covering us, and Taylor's got uh, a, a very nice uh, price target on us. I think it could be higher, but I'm not going to hold it against them. Uh, we also just picked up coverage from Research Capital, which is, uh, I guess, a sidearm of Mackey Financial as well. 
Um, you know, where we are right now, you'll see we're, we're range bound just as everyone else has been over the last year. Uh, what's interesting is um, whereas most of the industry right now is trading at their 52 week lows, uh, we're pushing higher. Um, you know, as we enter Q4, this is the time of year where people start to look at uh, tax loss selling. And, you know, you got a, a, a big portion of the industry hitting 52 week lows. They're going to be tax loss candidates and those might be uh, a force lower on short selling um, to lock in those profits. I think right now we're going to be a candidate for tax loss buying in the sense that people that are going to be selling their, their shares are going to be locking in those, um, uh, those tax losses and they're going to be sitting on some capital. Uh, they're going to want to deploy that into a company that uh, is active, that is catalyst, and uh, uh, we got plenty of both. Um, you know, in terms of our shareholder base, uh, it's been a hell of a, a year for us because we've effectively turned over our entire um, shareholder base where, you know, a year and a half ago, we were, you know, five, 10, $15 million market cap, 10, 15 cent stock. Uh, we hit a buck 60 last year. And since then, uh, on the on the back of that one drill hole I told you about, and since then, um, we've raised about $32 million. Now, all of that money uh, effectively went to institutional hands, very supportive. And all of that money was raised at levels slightly lower than where we are today meaning uh, we don't have huge profit taking ahead of us. I don't think at, at least, you know, we don't have that, that, that counter pressure that we had last year when we went from seven cents in March to a buck 60 in July. Um, and I don't see ourselves being a tax loss Canada this year, meaning I think the winds that are back and we've got nothing but catalysts lined up over the next three, four months uh, as we keep going on uh, uh, drilling out a project and delivering uh, uh, the first resource estimate on what is, uh, the second largest uh, silver district in all of uh, Nevada, which is known as the Silver State. Um, so what are we about? Uh, we've consolidated uh, half of uh, the Tonopah Silver District, and our project's called Tonopah West. As Taylor mentioned, we actually just staked uh, a whole new project directly adjacent to uh, Tonopah West called Tonopah North um, as well. And we're the largest landholder now in uh, the Tonopah Silver District. Now, this time, 100 years ago, Tonopah Silver District would have been the most active precious metals district in the U.S. Uh, in the span of about 30 years, it produced 174 million ounces of silver and nearly 2 million ounces of gold. And um, this is one of, to this day, one of the most significant uh, discoveries in Nevada mining history. In fact, it's partially the reason why Nevada is still a state to this day. Now, what's interesting is uh, uh, no one... Um, Certainly, you know, unless you're in the industry, not many people have heard about Tonopah until we started drilling it last year. Um, but uh, that's because we're the first group to get our hands on the lion's share of our property package uh, since production shut down in the 1930s. And we're literally just going in and picking up where these historic miners left off. And um, we've been putting one foot in front of the other. In about a year of drilling, we've become the most active silver exploration project in North America uh, by a country mile. We've drilled nearly 100,000 meters. We've got four drill rigs going. Uh, even in Nevada, we're one of the most active uh, junior mining uh, exploration projects down there um, in terms of uh, uh, what we're doing up there. And, and uh, you know, I know in terms of our assay lab, for example, I mean, uh, we're sort of right next behind um, uh, some of the major mining companies in terms of uh, the meters we're giving them. Um, you know, we're in Nevada and, and Nevada, uh, you know, these days people think of it for, you know, the massive gold deposits. But as I said, Nevada is a state really because of the silver discoveries made in the 1860s and uh, the Tonopah silver discovery, which was made in uh, or 1900. Uh, in terms of the silver state, we're the second largest um, uh, uh, historic mining camp down there, second to only the Comstock load. And frankly, um, knowing the history of both districts, I think it's not out of the question for Tonopah to grow to become the largest silver uh, producing district uh, uh, in Nevada, in the silver state, when all is said and done. And what we're showing right now is that the historic miners uh, left um, uh, a lot of goodness for, uh, behind for us, not due to um, any technical issues really at the mines or running out of what they thought uh, would be mineable reserves. Um, it was simply due to the business side of mining and precious metals prices tanking. Now, you know, being in the silver industry, what we have uh, in Nevada puts a massive target on our back. And um, anyone following, um, uh, I guess, the silver business knows that, you know, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, Russia, China, 
all of these places are the top silver producers by a country mile. Um, now, on the right side of your screen, or the or sorry, on the left side of your screen, are the top silver pr pr producing countries. Uh, and on the right side of your screen is the Fraser Index, uh, Fraser Institute Index of Investor Attractiveness. Um, Nevada is the best place to be putting your money based on the Fraser Indus uh, uh, Institute's investor attractiveness. Now, when you cross-reference that with all of the other silver producing jurisdictions, my goodness, do we have a competitive advantage. Um, you know, what we have with Tonopah, it's 100 to 1 silver to gold ratio, and it's bonanza grade stuff that we're drilling. But this is a pure uh, silver primary district. And really, when we're talking about uh, what we're drilling, it's just silver and gold. There's nothing else. We're not in the zinc business. We're not in the copper business. Uh, we're not mining. We're, we're not looking to mine letters, uh, uh, lead either. This is pure play precious metals district in Nevada. Um, you know, there's lots of other silver companies out there putting out fantastic drill results. Unfortunately, uh, I think the silver primary uh, producers out there right now are getting uh, absolute, um, uh, well, th they're getting nothing but uh, feedback from their investors that they need to offset their jurisdictional risk and look elsewhere when uh, looking to um, uh, uh, purchase or, or potential m and targets. Because places like Mexico, Peru, Argentina, Bolivia, they were shut down indiscriminately last year due to COVID. They're facing massive tax uh, implications and royalty implications. Uh, um, and certainly there's security issues too. We're on private land in Nevada. We're drilling on two sides of a highway uh, and um, uh, we're walking distance to a town. So what, what I'm getting at here is I think that our ounces in the ground that we deliver in this upcoming maiden resource estimate uh, are probably going to be worth more than anywhere else on the planet within the silver space right now. And we've got a target on our, on our back uh, the size of a barn door based off what we're drilling and the size potential we're showing uh, off of the 100,000 meters or so we've completed thus far. Now, Tonopah itself was a discovery made by accident. Uh, was this, you know, after the Comstock load had petered out uh, in the 1880s and early uh, 1890s, um, about two thirds of Nevada's population had fled to chase uh, riches elsewhere. Literally um, by the uh, early 1900s rolled around, um, it was just ranchers and, and uh, First Nations people that really remained there and Tonopah, uh, was actually discovered by a rancher, part-time prospector, who uh, was just going uh, um, uh, between mining camps and uh, his burrow. His donkey ran off. Uh, he chased it down and, and effectively found this big outcropping vein uh, at surface right next to us, right next to it, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert. Um, and thus, one of the most consequential discoveries in Nevada history was born. Um, the Tonopah discovery led to some of the biggest and most well-known discoveries in the Walker Lane District, including Goldfields and Bullfrog. It was the Tonopah discovery that uh, uh, really put Goldfields on the map. And, and before Las Vegas was around or really emerged, Goldfields was the largest city in Nevada uh, uh, up until the early 1930s. And that was purely because of this uh, discovery made by happenstance by a rancher and his donkey. And... As you'll see, this is a high grade discovery too. So not only is Tonopah known for its 100 to one silver to gold ratio, but they were producing ultra, ultra high grade stuff. Uh, 1.3 kilos silver, 16 grams gold is what they averaged over the history of um, commercial production. Well, why did it stop? Um, what you'll see is a near hockey stick chart up there in terms of um, uh, uh, average product production and and that discovery was made in 1900 and it set off this massive uh you know gold rush um in in, in nevada and the surrounding areas there and and uh all these companies came in they started setting up shop and they mined these rich rich veins right from surface they did no drilling back in the early days and they were just pulling ounces out of the ground at huge uh high high grades now it was a hockey stick chart up right up until roughly world war one or so and then there, down it went. But the real nail in the coffin and the real opportunity um, uh, for us was uh, what happened in 1923. And that was when um, silver prices and gold prices became unpegged due to what was called the Pittman Act. Uh, up until then, the Pittman Act had the U.S. government buying silver for a dollar an ounce. Uh, that ended in 1923. By 1930, silver prices were down to 35 cents an ounce and it sent everything belly up in the district. No one has been back in drilling uh, the, the main target area on a property since 
1930, when these claims were picked up out of receivership, um, were literally the first group to come back in. Uh, this area has been consolidated. It was done, uh, the hard yards of the consolidation were done by a company called Illegal Royalties, uh, which was just taken over by a company called Gold Royalty Corp now. Um, but they put this package together and it was this purple package here that was the missing link. Um, that was the holdings of a company known as the Tonopah Extension Mining Company. They're the third largest producer in the district. Now, what's important about this district is this is East-West Bain Corridor. So that discovery made by Jim Butler and his borough uh, was made by these big outcropping veins on the east side of town there. And what they did, as I said, was they just started mining these um, uh, right from surface and they followed them just doing drifts and crosscuts. Everything went westward. So in the early days, that hockey stick chart uh, I just showed you in the previous uh, slide there, all that production happened on the east side and then it moved to westward. Now, this map on the lower portion of your screen, that's what the district looked like in 1912. Those are all operating publicly traded, or most of them were publicly traded mining companies. Um, you cut that map down in half, we pretty much control that entire western half. And since then, since even this summer, we've now staked about 20 square kilometers that bolts onto the top because we've got a hell of a lot of data that the uh, historic miners weren't privy to. And uh, we think this district goes and goes. Um, now, what you'll see on this map, too, is uh, on the eastern side of town there, you'll see a town of Tonopah, and you won't see much on our side. There's not much in the way of development on our side. That yellow line going across the screen there uh, and going on, uh, cutting across your property, that's the highway. That highway connects Las Vegas and Reno. So we're literally drilling on both sides of this highway, uh, uh, walking distance to the town of Tonopah, um, and this purple portion here. This is where all of the uh, uh, really good mineralization that we've been hitting in the last year sits. And this is this property was 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 literally sitting in purgatory for the better part of 90 years until we got our hands on it. And um, this this property represented the last producing mines in the district when uh, production prices tanked in the 1930s. So what we're doing is we're literally picking up where historic miners left off. Uh, as I said, we started drilling uh, in June of last year. We were only going to be doing about 7,500 meters, I think, uh, uh, last year. That was the plan. I think we had, well, I can't remember how many drill holes. We ended up doing 30,000 meters between June and, and uh, December last year. Since then, we haven't had to stop. We haven't had to reload. Um, our model's predictive at this point, and, and this is the most active silver exploration project in North America, easily, probably one of the top three or four globally at this point. Uh, and easily the most exciting play in uh, Nevada too. Um, what we're doing now is uh, we've got, uh, uh, we're just completing our, our infill drill program. So we're gonna go from first drill holes ever into uh, uh, this large portion of the property to delivering a maiden resource estimate within the span of about a year and a half, which is unheard of uh, uh, when, when uh, drilling from surface on a vein system. Uh, we've been able to do this because uh, uh, Bill, who's going to be joining the call here shortly, uh, uh, has been hitting it out of the park in terms of, um, uh, I guess, the geologic concept we were testing and just moving forward now. We've got a monster by the tail here. Uh, what you'll see here is what um, is, is really what the project's all about. In the last year, we've hit 10 veins. Uh, you lay all these veins end to end at somewhere between six and seven kilometers of mineralized strike. Um, now, this yellow polygon unit you'll see this is the area which we call DPB. This includes six veins, the smallest of which is about 400 meters or so, uh, the largest of which is about 1.5 kilometers in strike. Uh, all of these veins are open. Um, now it's these veins here that are gonna form the, the basis for a maiden resource estimate that we're planning to deliver early in Q1. Uh, and we're finishing off that uh, drilling right now for that. So really uh, uh, between now and uh, the holidays, it's just nothing but a backlog of assays that are at the lab right now that we have to look forward to drilling into known veins. Our last release that I, I mentioned coming into this was some of our best intercepts ever at the project. And we've got 20 more of these at the lab pending assay. And the best part is um, all those veins to the northeastern portion of the uh, uh, screen here, uh, those aren't including in the resource. So we're not capping our upside either. We've got four veins uh, which go all the way to our eastern property boundary. Actually, one of those veins known as Victor, 
was uh, the site of um, our best intercept ever at the project to date. Um, and uh, those aren't even going to be included in the resource. So not only do we have blue sky uh, with huge expansion potential, but we've got all of these other veins. Pretty much half of our veins aren't even going to be included, and those have been drilled out too. So this is the DPB area that I told you about. Um, this area represented the last historic uh, uh, commercially operating mine when things shut down. Um, they mined it or, or did development work around to the 1650 foot level. And, and we actually inherited some um, uh, really nice hand-drawn cross sections uh, that where they stamped out a whole bunch of mineralization that effectively they did development work on, uh, but they never got to the point where they could mine it because the company had gone belly up uh, by that point due to low metals prices. Um, it went belly up because of the development work they did on this end of that Victor target that I told you about. Um, but really, they've been, that, that's been sitting there, uh, this mineralization has been sitting there on a silver platter for 90 years. And the difference between their hand-drawn cross-sections and the cross-sections that they did that development uh, work on and were preparing to mine uh, and the cross-sections we've now hit is that they had four veins that they knew about back then. Because um, they did no drilling, they didn't know about the veins unless they were sitting there right in front of their face. Uh, because we're the first group to drill this area, uh, we've now identified two brand new veins, uh, which we call the mule and the 76 vein. So uh, we've gone from four known veins to um, six veins in this area. And we've hit, you know, we're just drilling out extensions of those known veins. Um, you know, the proof of concept that we went to test last year was simply, did was it true? Did these miners really stop? Uh, 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 because of metals prices versus lack of mineralization. Well, we've now drilled out, you know, 1.5 kilometers on one of those known veins on Merton there. Uh, you'll see the Bermuda vein there too, which sort of forks out there. These are going to be the big kahunas for us, uh, ounce, but, uh, uh, ounce potential wise for the property. Some of our highest grade and thickest hits on the property are in this zone. Uh, but guess what? We've got four other veins in this area. Um, and uh, this is the Merton vein. The Merton vein is the big one. This is uh, right now it's up to 1.5 kilometers in strike. Uh, uh, we've got uh, it's open in both directions along strike. It's also what you'll notice here is that top to bottom, we've got 400 meters or so of high grade mineralization that we've been able to delineate here. Um, and on this known vein, actually, in fact, across all the known veins, in the DPB area, which is the basis for a resource, we're averaging about three meters thickness. So not only are we hitting some high, high grade stuff, but it's certainly at some really, really good thicknesses. Um, and then we've got, um, you know, just the tonnage potential here is quite extraordinary. This is the Victor target. Now this isn't even going into our, um, uh, going into our resource. This is the site of our very first drill hole into our property. We've now drilled uh, where we hit about 30 meters of a kilogram per ton silver equivalent. Um, we've hit some phenomenal grades as, as Taylor said, going into this. Uh, our results yesterday hit five kilos silver equivalent. Um, that included nearly three kilograms pure silver and 20 grams gold. Uh, at the property, you know, as I said, it's about 100 to 1 silver to gold ratio uh, based off what we're drilling. Um, uh, we've hit up to 26 grams gold. We've hit up to nearly three kilos silver now. Um, so it's not just silver that it's not just silver companies that, you know, would have an interest in what we're doing. It's some gold companies, too. And and being in Nevada, you know, this is the if, if this were Roman times in the gold space, Nevada would be Rome. Um, what I'll do right now is I'm going to hand it over to a, a little segment that Bill did. Um, where he's going to go through the geologic model, then both of us are going to come on after this uh, live to answer some questions. So, um, Taylor, Gracie, if you don't mind, could you switch it over to uh, Bill? Uh, the drilling that we're doing over in uh, DPB, which is this area here, is, is uh, showing good continuity, and we're able to uh, figure out which veins we're intersecting and basically predict them. So uh, that's always a good sign. Um, just to get you oriented, this is the town of Tonopah over on your right side here. This is uh, the highway between Las Vegas and Reno. Reno would be this direction. Las Vegas would be this direction. Uh, this is the uh, cemetery here. So uh, that's one place uh, we're drilling around. Um, obviously, we're not interested in the first six feet of that area. And uh, this is our DPB area. This is where the resources is going to be. Let's, uh, let's cut a section here. 
And we're going to uh, look to our, our west here. Let me just make some slight adjustments. We're going to look to our west. So uh, here we are. Uh, north is on this side to your right, and south is uh, on the left side. The colors represent uh, the different features. The uh, blue here are faults. This is our Pittsburgh Monarch fault system here and the McCain fault. You can see the veins are, are coming up against the, the McCain fault and uh, we have yet to uh, really figure out what's going on. So there's some opportunity here uh, between the, uh, the McCain and the uh, Pittsburgh Monarch fault. The red and uh, kind of uh, and magenta colors, those are our veins. This is the Denver vein. This is the mule vein in pink. And then here we have the Paymaster, the Bermuda, the, uh, uh, sorry, the Bermuda here is this vertical one, and the Merton, and then a new vein that we're working on called the 76 vein. Uh, what I've done here is I've put uh, these magenta colors on the drill holes. Uh, those are composites that are greater than 200 gram per ton. Uh, silver equivalent. And just to, you know, highlight some of those, you can in blue here. There we go. So this is uh, 1,200 uh, grams per ton uh, silver equivalent. Remember, our silver equivalent is gold and silver, nothing else. So uh, we use a 100 to 1 ratio. And uh, that's over uh, 3.6 meters. So there's 1,200 uh, grams silver equivalent over 3.6 meters. You can look at this one on the uh, mule vein. This is uh, 1,500 uh, grams per ton silver equivalent, and that's over 4.5 meters. Uh, we can look at this one down here. This is an interesting intersection. Uh, this is uh, 300 gram per ton over 12.2 uh, meters. So as you can see, we've got uh, some good thickness in the veins. Uh, over here at Denver, this is 550 grams per ton silver equivalent over uh, 4.6 meters. And uh, another one here on the Denver, this is uh, uh, almost 450 at 3.3 uh, meters. So you can see we, we have uh, good thicknesses in the veins. Uh, we're using a 200 gram per ton uh, silver equivalent cutoff. Uh, the veins were able to uh, basically predict where they're at. Uh, we're still waiting on, a, on a, a whole lot of drill holes to come back from the lab. We're, we're behind about uh, 30 or 32 drill holes. And uh, so some of this is going to fill in uh, when those come back. But uh, we're really excited by what we're seeing here on the, uh, the Merton. Uh, very good high grade, or sorry, on the Bermuda. Very good high grades on this structure here. And the Merton, we're starting to see some interesting zones, uh, both thickness and grade at this intersection. So a uh, uh, very exciting time. As we uh, move uh, to the west, um, you can see the, the grades here again, staying uh, uh, in the Bermuda vein. Um, I we... There's that 1200 again. There's, uh, oops, that's something else. Uh, there's 2,000 over uh, four meters. So again, as I said, this uh, Bermuda vein is, is very high grade in this intersection. Uh, it's uh, looking very good. Uh, we're starting to put the kind of the regional picture together. And uh, you may have heard we, we just recently staked some uh, new claims. So we're going to have uh, a look at those, uh, those next. Okay, I'm just going to hopefully that's coming through. Mm -hmm. Let's just uh, have a look. So what I've done here is uh, I've got these two maps uh, at the same scale. Uh, this is uh, the Tonopah area. Uh, this is Crater Lake in Oregon. Uh, these two maps are at the same scale. I just want to show you this. Uh, what we're looking at is basically a caldera. And uh, our vein systems on the margin of this northern caldera, we'll call it the Tonopah caldera. 
And it's about the same size as uh, as Crater Lake. And if you've ever been to Crater Lake, uh, you can get a sense of uh, what this is. But uh, what we've been doing basically is uh, uh, mapping around the margin, trying to understand the edge of the caldera, and uh, looking at our vein system that we know about. So here's our veins down here in Tonopah. And what we've been able to see is that this uh, Merton vein is really following that edge of the caldera. And we believe it's going to wrap around into this area here. The other thing we have going on are a series of these uh, northwest faults. So we talked about the Pittsburgh Monarch Fault and the McCain Fault. Those are these blue lines here. Uh, they're basically coming up following, uh, almost following along the, the county boundary here between Nye County and Esmeralda County. And uh, what we want to do is uh, see where those faults uh, cut through the caldera again. We think that will be a good place to, uh, to maybe find some more gold and silver. So uh, we've got those faults coming this way, uh, the caldera margin, and we're quite excited by this uh, Pittsburgh Monarch extension target. There's a little, uh, there's quite a bit more work to do. We've, we've just finished some gravity and some magnetics, and uh, we're quite excited by uh, uh, what we're starting to see there. Uh, up here to the north, we really like this area here. We see a lot of east-west structure uh, coming through, and uh, you see this big offset in the geology here, and that's the Mizpah andesite here. And this big east-west structure through here, uh, you know, we like that. We like east-west. We see that down here on the south end. And uh, what this basically represents is the ability or the opportunity to, to maybe find another Tonopah district and recover. These are all cover rocks, and so, you know, there's nothing outcropping. So the old-timers, when they went through here, they they wouldn't have had a ledge or a vein or anything to sample. It would have been covered up. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use some more geophysics here, some uh, gravity, magnetics, some CSAMT to refine this target, as well as some additional mapping of, of the cover rocks. We're seeing a, a unit here that really is telling us where the margin of the caldera is. And that's, that's what we're using to uh, identify uh, the edge of the caldera and uh, these targets here. Awesome. Well, it's phenomenal. Well, so what we'll do now is, uh, I guess, to open it up for Taylor, and I'll bring Bill on here as well. Bill, that's a great photo of you. Um, <laughs> why don't you show us what you really look like? Yeah, that's my pre-COVID photo. <laughs> Has the pandemic not been well to you? <laughs> yeah, I, I've got the freshman fifteen, I guess. Okay, well, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right, so yeah, now we'll we'll open it up to questions. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew and uh, the Bill on the video for uh, giving the presentation. Um, so we'll take your questions now. Just a reminder to everybody uh, that you can type them in at any point. Uh, we do have a number uh, that have already come in. Um, first one up, uh, just wondering uh, about the uh, why why you're using the 100 to 1 silver gold ratio uh, for silver equivalent yeah well that's a very good question um so when we started drilling the pro well when we picked up the project last year in february i think the day we signed it was the all-time silver gold ratio spread it was a uh, 125 to 1. Uh, when we started drilling it and releasing results it was 100 to 1. Uh, since then we haven't stopped um now what we want to do is for this phase of drilling i mean normally you know, companies aren't as aggressive as we are, right? So uh, you, they do a phase and then they shut down and then they do another phase. What we're doing is uh, the we're drilling into what we know is going to be roughly 100 to 1 silver gold equivalent anyways. And when we started releasing results, uh, it was about 100 to 1 silver equivalent anyways. So if we keep switching it based off spot prices every single time, it's going to be hard to benchmark it. Now, we release gold and silver values separately regardless um, uh, and there's only two equivalents going into it. So I know you, when you're modeling it, you're, you're doing your own evaluation or, 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 or formula, um, and based off whatever it is, uh, people can do whatever they want. Um, but we've just been using one uniform, uh, one uniform number for this phase of drilling, 
uh, that's all going to the resource just because it would be confusing otherwise. And because, yeah, it's just two things. There's no financial engineering going on here. Uh, it's not like we've got letters, ink, or copper that we're throwing in there too and trying to eke out a silver primary number. No, it's just silver and gold. Use it whenever you want. Uh, we just figured in the year and a half, it's it's gone down from 125 down to 62. Now we're back up to around 80. I mean, are we going to do it? We, and we haven't stopped drilling, so we're we just going to move it every single time. I think it's just easier to use whatever you want to use. Um, uh, the majors and the mid-tiers and, you know, First Majestic came in. Uh, I don't know what they use, but uh, uh, all I know is this is high-grade stuff uh, on private land in Nevada. And, yeah, that's that. Great. Okay. Um, have a question wondering uh, why the Victor vein was excluded uh, or will be excluded from the, the upcoming resource. Yeah, well, you know, we've got enough and, and you know, I'll, I'll hand it over to Bill too on this, but uh, uh, we know roughly how big the Victor vein is because it goes all the way to the property edge. Um, now, the issue is, is to deliver a resource, you need to have drill spacing down to a certain density. Um, now, we've hit it probably every 100 meters or so. We know it's at least 500 meters in strike. Suma Silver, uh, which is to our uh, east, they've hit that out another 300 meters on their side. And I should say that Suma Silver also uses that 100 to 1 silver gold ratio as well for the same reasons that we do. We started drilling in the same uh, week of last year. They, you know, they've got the eastern half of the district. We've got the western half. And they've been doing it too. Uh, the only difference in how we report is we use a 200 gram cutoff. Uh, and they've been using a 100, but that's neither here nor there. Um, uh, but uh, really, it's just drill density. It's uh, that Victor area, that northeastern portion of our property, it's right up against the town. So there is more development up there. There's some old houses, um, some junkyards and stuff. So it's really hard to uh, uh, drill it from surface to get that density we're after. But um, Bill, did I miss anything? Yeah, one of the, one of the issues we have in that part of the district is... Uh, there's a lot of uh, workings in the upper levels and we have to kind of thread the needle through the workings to get down into uh, the down dip portion of the Victor. And it's it's uh, quite difficult sometimes. And so uh, we feel like it's just better to wait um, and, and do it from an underground uh, access point rather than try to uh, continue to thread the needle through those old workings. So, so you, you know, also, you, you know, what we're trying to get from delivering this resource estimate on DPB uh, is to show the market that, you know, the ounces are there, there, we've got some grade, we've got some size potential, but we'll be showing that blue sky of Victor. Now, what's interesting is, is really that whole area, uh, all that mineralization is cut off by a system known as the Pittsburgh Monarch Fault. But the way the DPB area was discovered was uh, when Victor shut down in the early 1920s due to um, hitting some water and, and, you know, waiting for water pumps to be installed, uh, the old time miners just drifted across and they hit all these veins in DPB and they started, you know, doing development work there. These veins, uh, you know, both Victor and DPB will be accessible um, for us uh, if we end up going underground next year. And that's really what we're trying to justify with this resource estimate is if this resource estimate shows that the juice is going to be worth the squeeze, uh, the ounces are there at DPB. We'll drive an exploration um, uh, uh, decline next year, and that's going to give us access to both DPB and the Victor side. And the Victor side will be a layup for us to um, drill out from underground and add those ounces in that we know are going to be there because we've already, you know, we know how far it goes. But we, it's hard to hit from surface. So getting underground, justifying it with the DPB, um, will give us access next year to add those Victor ounces in as well when we look to upgrade the resource, whenever that may be. Great. Okay. Um, the um, another question, uh, just wondering about. Um, uh, well, there, there's a number of questions actually uh, asking about your Silver Cloud asset and and what the status is on that, and if there's uh, still the plan to uh, spin that out. Yeah, well, you, you know, the one thing we have on our side is time with Silver Cloud. Um, when we hit last year at Tonopah, obviously Tonopah became the flagship. Um, all of our valuation right now is tied into Tonopah. And what's interesting is, you know, we only picked up Tonopah last year. Uh, before we had Tonopah, I mean, BlackRock, I, I think, uh, you know, when Bill and I joined, we got it up to around $30 million market cap just on Silver Cloud. Um, when we hit last year at Tonopah, 
uh, you know, we started thinking about, okay, well, how do we, how do we daylight some value for silver cloud too? Because right now uh, it's not getting much love. And we said, well, spin out would be perfect. Uh, life happens when you're planning other things, as they say. Uh, we, we said that in September last year. Since then, the GDXJ is off about 30, 35%. Um, it was not the market to uh, daylight any value with a grassroots gold target, um, a generative gold target, uh, because we'd be putting it, we'd be, we'd be unlocking it and it would be, you know, cast away into a market that just doesn't care about grassroots um, or early stage discoveries. And what we have right now is we're just waiting for, for sentiment to change a little bit. Uh, Silver Cloud's not going anywhere. But what, what, what has happened up there uh, subsequent to all of this is a massive new discovery up on the Northern Nevada Rift, right adjacent to, well, yeah, right on trend of what Silver, where Silver Cloud is. Hecla Mining Company uh, controls the Hollister Mine right next to us and the Midas Mine um, northwest of us. And we're the big donut hole in Phil Baker's claim map up there. And we easily represent some of the lowest hanging exploration fruit simply because not much work has been done up there. And it's, you know, if you're a geologist, like all the pathfinder elements up there, it's like going to Disneyland, uh, outcropping veins at surface, mercury mines. Um, it, it's, it's really wild. But what happened at Midas recently was Hecla made a brand new discovery up there. Uh, they drilled about four ounces per ton gold uh, in a blind target discovery they made uh, about six months ago called the Green Racer Sinter Discovery. They haven't been talking about it too much, but they've got multiple drill rigs drilling that out. That's one of the most exciting discoveries in northern Nevada in a long time. And guess what? We control 45 square kilometers up there, right on trend of that. Um, and we're within walking distance to two mills that they control as well. Um so we're just waiting for the right time to unlock value. In the interim, it's nice to have another poker chip up or, well, another card up or sleeve in case, you know, someone does come knocking and wants to, uh, well, takes us out for, for Tonopah because what we have in the silver space being high grade gold and silver showing significant ounce potential in the heart of Nevada on private land. Uh, you know, I think there might be a feeding frenzy on us soon after delivery of this resource. If there is, it's nice to have Tonopah, uh, sorry, silver cloud up or sleeve in case uh, we want to spin that out um, at that time and, and keep going. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. And then um, kind of, I guess, continuing on that theme um, a little bit uh, with the you know potential once that resource is out and, and what could happen, um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, it's a bit biased, but what, what do you see as, uh, see a significant re-rate of the stock uh, when the resource estimate comes out? Um, I guess, what, what are the like concise, consistent points? I, I think, in my opinion, the whole presentation kind of supports, you know, what, what could happen. Well, you put a price target on us. Why don't you, why, why don't you give us your interpretation? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the uh, you know, pre premium jurisdiction, you know, like that was outlined pretty clearly. You know, this is tier one jurisdiction, Nevada. Uh, it's our favorite jurisdiction here at uh, Red Cloud. Um, you know, the, the fact that you've done an uh, immense amount of drilling, you know, what's there, um, uh, you know, the, the access to that infrastructure right in Tonopah, it's a known mining district. Uh, the fact that there's already been a major, uh, investment from, uh, uh, first majestic, you know, that's obviously put you on the radar, uh, of the majors, you know, there's lots of people, uh, looking at that. Um, you know, you've had great success as well, just based on the drill results and the high grade nature of the, the deposit. Uh, the fact that it's, you know, a, uh, a um, uh, as, you know, uh, as you outlined the, um, uh, you know, there's no polymetallic component. It's all precious metals, you know, largely silver, some gold in there as well. Um, you know, I think that all bodes really well for, a, you know, a, a, a good uh, re-rate uh, with that resource estimate. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, the, you know, the company we're often compared to most just because of story and, and what we're doing and what we're drilling in terms of grade and the gold silver ratio and all that would be Silvercrest. Um, Silvercrest consolidated a historic silver and gold district in Mexico about three, four years ago. They started drilling it, turning it into Swiss cheese. They delivered a maiden resource of about 60 million silver equivalent ounces a few years ago. They since upgraded that to about 90 million ounces uh, on their first upgrade. And now they're, you know, uh, construction ready and they've got roughly about 130 million silver equivalent ounces, similar grades to what we're hitting. Um, and they're about $1.5 to $2 billion market cap, depending on the day in the market. 
Uh, we're trading right now around $100 million market cap. Uh, in terms of what we're targeting, we think we can beat what Silver Cloud, Silver Crest put out for their maiden resource estimate. And guess what? We're not in Mexico. We're not in Sinaloa or any of these other places. We're halfway between Las Vegas and Reno. Uh, we're drilling next to Burger King right now. Uh, power, water, workforce, um, drilling on both sides of a highway. And uh, uh, yeah, we think our ounces in the ground are going to be worth more than anywhere else on the planet. So I like to look at Silvercrest as a corollary. I don't think the majors or mid-tiers are going to let us grow to silver cloud, uh, Silvercrest size. I think they're going to try and scoop us up once we de-risk the project. Um, and and what we've done now, I mean, in May of this year, we were a buck twenty. That was when silver was twenty eight bucks. Obviously, and the market's gone, uh, tides have gone out a little bit. We've since released about fifty drill holes, and we've de-risked the property substantially because we're showing continuity of the grades right now. As of the last time I checked my phone, we were trading at eighty five cents Canadian. Uh, we're a far better purchase now than we were at a buck twenty in May. Uh, we've we're we're we're, we're we've got. 24 drill results at the lab pending assay, three rigs at surface uh, uh, drilling right now. Those are going to be continue to be cut down. We sent one home two or three weeks ago, and we're scaling down now as the resource drilling is done. Um, but, yeah, what we're showing now is just continuity. We already know size potential. We know expansion potential exists on these known veins at the DPB area. And we've got 20 square kilometers of undrilled targets uh, that have to represent some of the best undrilled targets in all of Nevada at this point. Um, uh, so yeah, we got the wind at our back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. And the um, there's, I guess, a, a question that fits in with that. Uh, just, I guess, kind of more for for me actually. It's just um, somebody wondering what our uh, price target is on on BlackRock. Uh, so right now we have a two fifteen uh, price target. Um, you can refer to all our research on our website. Uh, that's uh, that was put out in our update piece uh, from September 20th. If you want to take a look at that, uh, that has our uh, re mineral inventory estimate in it as well that uh, uh, viewers might find uh, interesting. I think it's low. <laughs> um, a couple of corporate questions. Uh, what is your current cash position? Yeah. So after this, you know, so we've done this big space race, um, you know, we've deployed about 32 million, we've raised 32 and a half million dollars or so since July of last year. Uh, we've probably spent about 30 of that into uh, just into the going into the ground in terms of drilling um, and all of that. Uh, uh, well, most of that drilling is focused on DPB uh, and, and this resource drilling that's going to be done in the next few weeks here. Uh, after that, um, you know, we should be in a position to coast. Um, through the resource estimate uh, 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 delivery of that. And I see that being the mother of all re-rates for us, you know, giving, giving analysts um, that, that haven't covered us yet a chance to really value us based off the ounces in the ground and showing that upside that we have a Victor already. Um, but moreover, uh, all the scout drilling that we want to do, we might turn our focus to that while we're waiting. So as Bill said in his presentation, uh, we've had some geophysics conducted. Uh, we're going to be doing some more. Uh, on that Tonopah North target. And if we can get a permitting in place, we'd love to hit that, uh, those two targets with this, some scout drilling using the RC. And that's cheap as chips to do, right? I mean, our, our, the RC is about, you know, a third of the cost of the core drilling, which we're using for the basis of a resource estimate at DPB. So, um, yeah, we're, we're in a good position through the uh, through delivery of the resource here. And unless some, someone was going to make us a really accretive uh, 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 offer, um, you know, as you mentioned, First Majestic's already in, um, you, you know, to to show some more blue sky or keep focused on expansion drilling. I mean, we're, we're in a good position to just uh, uh, get those targets defined and then maybe hit them early in the new year with, with uh, the RC. Okay. And um, another corporate question, uh, just wondering about management's uh, ownership of the company. Yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, never enough. Um, you know, Bill and I came in, I came into BlackRock, not um, uh, not because I wanted the job, but uh, because I was a large shareholder in uh, uh, the company back when I just had SilverCloud and I wasn't really uh, in, all that impressed with how management was running it at that time. Um, and right now, I think I, uh, you know, between all the shares I own and Warren's probably control about 6 million, uh, 6 million shares and all said and done, I think as a management team, um, uh, probably five to six, seven percent, uh, five, six, five or six percent of the float uh, is controlled. Uh, 
you know, our last financings, two directors participated. Bill just exercised a whole bunch of options. Uh, we've got skin in the game here, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at this not because of it's a job, but because we want to add value to the shares. Great. Okay. And uh, I think we're getting down on questions here. Um, we do have one other that's a bit uh, seasonal in nature, and, uh, you know, we'll uh, leave it on, on this one maybe. Uh, just somebody wondering if Tonopah is haunted. Bill, why don't you tell your ghost story? Is Tonopah haunted? Uh, of course it is. Of course it is. It's got the Clown Motel and the Mizpah Hotel, the most haunted motel and hotel in all of the U.S. So, of course it is. Bill, Bill, Bill's seen them. I don't know how many drinks he had, but he's seen some some kids playing games, and I heard them at least. Uh, in the middle of the night, staying at the Mizpah Hotel. It's you know, Tonopah is a very special place. It's this old, you know, it's a typical sort of boom mining town. Um, and you you know, you drive from Vegas on this massive highway interstate, and then it just whittles down. It goes from you know four or five lanes down to two. Then there's portions of one, and as you get further and further away from Vegas, uh, the highway doesn't turn. It 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 stops being a highway. You drive through gold fields and Beatty. And then you Beatty, then Goldfields, and then you end up in Tonopah. But the highway literally just turns into the, you know, goes through the town and, and um, you know, goes right across our property. But it's a very cute, charming little town. Uh, lots of history there. I mean, you know, people like Mark Twain came through there. Wyatt Earp ran a, a, a saloon on her property. And there's some great uh, stories in some of the books that have been immortalized in Tonopah on Wyatt Earp's involvement there. Uh, you know, Jim Butler and Tasker, you know, Tasker Audi, who was involved in the discovery, went on to become the governor of um, the state of Nevada in the early 1900s. Um, yeah, it's a really, really uh, a charming place. Certainly, um, there's, a cem as Bill said, there's a cemetery that we're drilling under on a property, which is a first for him in his career. And there's also a pet cemetery on a property, which is probably the um, uh, weirdest place I've ever been to in my life. Uh, so... It's a, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it, it's a very special place. And I think uh, what we're showing right now is the history books in Tonopah. Uh, they're going to need to be rewritten at least a few more chapters there because what the historic miners pulled out, I think there's far more of that left to uh, 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 left in enjoy for us as, uh, as, as operators and the shareholders. So we'll see. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm, you know, we'll, definitely be paying attention to uh, all the results to come and the uh, maiden resource uh, in the near term. So I'd like to thank uh, both Andrew and uh, Bill uh, from BlackRock Silver for taking the time to host the webinar today with Red Cloud Securities. And thank you very much to everybody on the line uh, for tuning in with us today. Thank you.